Good afternoon. My name is John DeDecker, and I'm the Vice President of Exploration of SK Mining Corp. And uh, we're going to discuss um, our project that we've had not only in 2020, but um, uh, during my tenure as VP of Exploration, we'll discuss some other things from 2020 and 2021 as well. <clears throat> so uh, obviously, we have a disclaimer. I will be talking about forward-looking statements during this talk. So please do your own due diligence uh, concerning um, investing. So to start off, uh, we are looking for precious metal VMS deposits, that is gold and silver rich VMS deposits. Um, notably in our area is the historic Eskay Creek mine, uh, which was historically the highest grade VMS deposit in the world. Uh, here we have a chart here, which has deposit tonnage on the uh, x-axis on the bottom and our gold grade in grams per ton here on this axis. And you can see here um, a whole slew of these very high grade gold rich VMS deposits. Um, the majority of these are from the Naranda district in Quebec. So this is part of the Abitibi um, mining camp. And uh, then we have SK Creek up here, which is in the Golden Triangle of Northwestern British Columbia. And you can see uh, that SK Creek is standing um, out above the pack as far as um, its gold endowment. And it's quite well silver endowed as well. But the interesting thing is where all of these other uh, VMS deposits are occurring in camps or clusters with each other, because that's how these deposits form in clusters, SK Creek is standing there all by itself. Uh, the only reason that's the case is because SK2 and 3 have not been discovered yet. And that's what we're going to talk about today. That is the goal of our company is to find another SK Creek type deposit. So here's our uh, property. We have a 602 square kilometer property uh, in the part of the Golden Triangle. So right up here uh, off of the uh, southern tip of the Alaska Panhandle. And uh, over here on the right side of the screen is our, our claim package in gold. Uh, so you'll see that we have quite a large uh, claim package surrounding SK Creek right here. So we actually enclose all the ground um, that uh, Skeena um, has been operating on with SK Creek to uh, quite a bit of success finding um, a lot of expansion of this historic high grade uh, VMS mineralization along this trend on the SK Anticline, which I'll talk about here shortly. Uh, it's also quite well endowed in precious metals off to our east uh, with the Kerr, Sulfurus, Mitchell, and Iron Cap uh, porphyry deposits uh, that uh, Seabridge um, Exploration is exploring for. And then we have other uh, properties in the area as well, such as uh, Treaty Creek, uh, yet another a uh, gold rich porphyry deposit uh, the Tudor uh, gold is looking at. And then we have our neighbors um, over here to our west, Garibaldi resources. And there's um, quite a bit of nickel uh, in that area as well as the potential for VMS mineralization. So we're in a very well endowed part of um, the planet, actually. It's quite well endowed. Um, and that's what we're looking for is this VMS type of uh, mineralization. However, there are other types of deposits that may be on our property, notably orogenic uh, gold deposits and porphyry deposits. However, our primary focus again is on uh, this SK Creek type uh, precious metal rich VMS mineralization. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit of infrastructure nearby uh, where we to advance towards a mine stage. Uh, there's the SK Mine Road that uh, provide that access to the historic mine, as well as the current operations of Skeener Resources and other operators along the SK Mine Road. Uh, there's actually uh, quite a bit of a uh, hydroelectric infrastructure up here, some of which is on our claims. Uh, it provides up to 300 uh, megawatts of uh, power generation. And then the Coulter Creek Access Road um, that's uh, being built by Seabridge, as well as uh, with some of our contribution, is coming off of the SK Mine Road 
and going down onto our property and actually uh, going to be providing quite a bit of road access to our Sib and Lulu showings, which I'll discuss in a bit. And it goes right by Jeff and TV, which has been some of our focus over the past few years. So there is uh, advancing infrastructure in the area that will provide more accessibility to our project, which is currently helicopter supported. So I'll start talking about our exploration program in 2022. Um, and I came on as a postdoctoral researcher to do a data review on this project. And one of the first things that stood out to me was one, not only um, how widespread gold and silver mineralization is in rock chip samples, as well as historic drilling that's been conducted over the past 33 uh, years or so, pretty much since the discovery of Eskay Creek mine. Uh, but, you know, we also have a large land package that really has not been mapped uh, very well. It's just so large that the a scale of mapping that's been done uh, previously doesn't really capture um, what's going on on this property. So that was one of the first things we started to do was uh, go through our historic database and identify key areas that warranted further exploration and then get our team out and get boots on the ground. And this summer under the direction of um, Dr. Ben Fryman, who's uh, back there, he's our uh, chief um, mapping and structural geologist, as uh, well as uh, myself, um, Dr. Jesse Hill here, our drone pilot, and then Dr. Samuel Pierre, who's a, a VMS expert, um, one of my, uh, former colleagues from Colorado School of Mines, we got out and got boots on the ground and really started to look in detail at the geology in this area. Uh, we actually have about 1,500 different mapping and sample points covering a whole broad range of uh, deposit types and geographic locations on this property uh, to identify the most prospective areas for uh, this SK Creek type BMS mineralization. So as you'll remember from that uh, first slide, I mentioned that VMS deposits occur in clusters. That's what we're looking for here are these uh, clusters of VMS deposits. And I'll say, um, kind of spill the beans, we've had success identifying more VMS deposits on our property. So this is a kind of our preliminary um, reinterpretation of the uh, geology in the area. And uh, we want to talk about the, the broad picture here. We have uh, the two types of rock that are really hosting the BMS mineralization, um, broadly lumped into what we call the Hazelton group. Uh, this is a, a group of a volcanic and volcanoclastic sedimentary rocks associated with back arc rifting or the opening up of a marine basin. And this is the type of environment that uh, volcanogenic massive sulfide or VMS mineralization is formed in. Uh, so you have the SK Creek mine up here at the, the northern end of this structure called the SK Anticline. Uh, the historic high grade mineralization uh, is hosted by uh, what is called the Upper Hazelton Group, uh, notably the SK Rhyolite. Um, this is hosting what uh, mostly what Skeena has been drilling recently, as well as the high grade historic intercepts. And this trend of mineralization and SK Rhyolite continues on the west limit of the anticline onto our property. And uh, this is the uh, Sib showing and the Lulu showing here. Um, something else that had been identified uh, by previous drill programs, but I don't think was appreciated. Uh, was the fact that there's all of this lower Hazelton group um, andesites here, which is also mineralized. And it's quite likely that this mineralization in the lower Hazelton group could be up to 20 million years older than the mineralization hosted by the upper Hazelton group. Uh, so one of the things that our team has really been able to figure out for this area is that we've got stacked VMS mineralization. That means there are multiple horizons throughout the stratigraphy that host VMS mineralization, and that there were most likely two um, distinct events associated with this mineralization, an older one 
uh, that is represented by TB, Jeff, and Jeff North, and, and uh, several intercepts uh, up here at Sib and Lulu, and then a younger one uh, that is associated with Sib Lulu, as well as Eskay Creek Mine, and as I'll talk about um, our newer uh, showings that we explored this year over here on the uh, Scarlet Tarn uh, trend over here to the northeast part of our property. And, you know, it's interesting to note we do have newly identified exposures of this upper Hazelton group, SK Rhyolite, down here at one of our um, sky tim or uh, geophysical targets called Excelsior. So property-wide prospectivities, what we're going for here, we're looking for a VMS district. That's how these things form. Uh, so one of the first things we did uh, for exploration in 2020 was conduct a property-wide BLEG survey. That's bulk leach extractable gold. It's a stream sampling technique that is really going after the clay-sized fraction of um, minerals within a stream. And that's avoiding the nugget effect that may come with heavy mineral separation. And it really gives a more representative um, idea of the gold endowment of a particular drainage basin. And uh, here, you know, anything that's colored orange, red, or this magenta color is actually pretty um, high um, grade results for a BLEG survey. And what we see is that we've got clusters of these uh, really um, strong BLEG anomalies, and notably up here at SIB. This is along our trend with the SK Creek mine. And then coming uh, down, the anticline is actually a thrust fault that kind of covers up some of uh, our prospect of horizons over here. Drilling indicates they continue. Uh, but then down here at the Excelsior showing uh, this upper Hazelton group stratigraphy on the west limb, the anticline, actually daylights again. And sure enough, we've got a trend of blood anomalies down here that are associated with SK rhyolite, uh, which suggests that this trend of mineralization that you know, really beginning up here at SK Creek continues for tens of kilometers uh, down to the uh, south. And that's just on the west limb of the SK Anticline. There's two sides to these folds. And that is what uh, the TV and Jeff deposits that's been a big part of the focus over the past couple of years. Those are posted on the east limb of the SK Anticline within this lower Hazelton group stratigraphy. And then Continuing this Hazelton group trend, which is really prominent in this conductivity or uh, sky tim uh, map that we acquired in 2021, you can see that these structures actually continue uh, down here toward uh, the C10 deposit. Uh, and then jumping over to this other cluster of anomalies here, uh, we have our uh, Scarlet uh, Ridge, Scarlet Valley, Scarlet Knob, and Torn Lake. Uh, showings, which are uh, some of the things that we've been working on in 2022 and have turned into a, a quite a major focus um, and quite exciting area for us to look at. I should note that this conductivity uh, survey has proven very useful for identifying um, VMS uh, stock work and sulfide mineralization, uh, notably here at our uh, TV uh, showings here, as well as at Jeff and Jeff North, and over here at Horn Lake, and then the Scarlet Ridge, Scarlet Knob areas is always associated with these really intense uh, conductors to sort of a moderate conductive anomaly. And uh, we've had really good success identifying this type of VMS sulfide mineralization using uh, our SkyTim technique. So zooming in on the SK anticline trend, I'd like to start uh, talking about the focus of our program over the last few years, uh, notably on our uh, TV deposit here and Jeff up here, and then an extension of Jeff to the north uh, that we call Jeff North. And then we've done, um, in addition to drilling, rock chip sampling and systematic soil sampling over this large you know, it's about a six kilometer or so um, along strike swath of ground here that we've um, 
prospected and identified uh, several anomalies uh, within uh, the soil, notably silver anomalies, as well as a, um, a whole host of uh, gold and silver bearing rock chip samples continuing even further uh, to the north. Uh, so while in the past few years we've really explored this area, there is still a lot of work to be done continuing uh, to the north as well as over here on uh, this west limb of the anticline. So it's quite a large area. Um, should note, uh, we've had to build uh, some hilly pads in this area just to get access. It's the reason there aren't any samples in this middle area is because it's very rugged. Um, we were able to send a couple of guys out, hike uh, a couple kilometers with a chainsaw, and they made some hilly pads. And now we have access to this underexplored part of our property to continue our um, investigations of this prolific, uh, prolifically mineralized SK anticline. So uh, start looking at uh, TV here. Uh, this is a combination of um, all the uh, drill results that uh, we've had over the past three years that have been released to date. Uh, so this is our uh, TV, a map V right here, showing that uh, this deposit extends uh, over well over 150 meters, more approaching 200 meters along strike right here. Uh, this would be our upper uh, stock work and massive sulfide zone right here, which our drilling this year is uh, showing that this area is actually going to be expanded as we encounter quite a bit of massive sulfide mineralization between these drill holes and down over to these drill holes. And that massive sulfide mineralization is overlying a stock work or feeder zone of vein type sulfide mineralization, which looking at this view here, which is kind of looking down dip. So we're really looking at the true thickness of this zone. We've got our massive sulfide, a very extensive stock work zone that we're able to uh, find the orientation of and drill along this zone and encounter some very long intercepts of robust gold and silver mineralization during our 2021 program. And then there's also a lower massive sulfide zone underlain by another um, smaller stock work zone uh, underneath this lower mass of sulfide. So it is a stacked VMS system, which is a common occurrence. Um, I would um, encourage everyone to watch some of the um, talks that I've given on more of the kind of science behind VMS deposits. And I, I go into detail about uh, that um, and those talks on our website. So looking at the mineralization at TV, I'm going to focus on this upper mass of sulfide zone that we discovered last season. Um, we encountered a massive clastic sulfide that's actually been uh, remineralized with additional pulses of um, pyrite, calcopyrite, and spalorite mineralization. Uh, these rocks are uh, gold and silver bearing. A and then uh, some of our drill uh, intercepts from this year as well uh, that have extended this massive sulfide zone along strike and showing that the entire stock work zone is overlain by massive sulfide, uh, ranging anywhere from about four to 10 meters in thickness. That's underlain by a fault, which uh, I don't, we're not certain at this point how much offset there is, but that does uh, suggest that there's a possibility uh, for wherever this uh, sulfide was displaced from to uh, find additional mineralization at TV, uh, whether that be stock work or massive sulfide uh, mineralization. So we'll have our uh, structural geologist working on um, that to determine if um, we can narrow down where uh, this stuff may have come from. And then underlying this massive sulfide is a very broad and about 50 to 100 meter thick zone of gold and silver bearing stock work type mineralization, uh, dominantly hosted by intensely silicified mudstone. And what this is telling us is that we've got, we're right on the seafloor position and the core of this VMS system where hydrothermal alteration is most intense. And that sure enough is where most of the gold and silver mineralization is 
and then this stuff in turn is overlain by a um a broad zone of uh, VMS or massive sulfide mineralization. <clears throat> so looking at some of the numbers, um, some highlights uh, that we've had uh, released from this year as well as last season uh, showing that, um, you know, for instance, whole uh, 109 here, this is one of the massive sulfide intercepts right here. And that's um, nearly 15 meters at uh, 2.41 grams per ton gold equivalent. So again, we have quite a bit of silver in this system. So uh, we have a silver credit here. Uh, and then um, going along uh, strike, actually, TB2154 is a combination of massive sulfide near the top, as well as stock work um, feeder uh, toward the bottom. And this is a, a very thick intercept of uh, 92 meters at 2.7 grams per ton gold equivalent. And that's fairly typical of the thickness of this zone, of the stock work zone. You know, we're ranging between 50 to 90 meters in true thickness for this. And then holes like TB2163 drilled along strike through the stock work zone, and we're able to show continuity of mineralization. In this case, uh, we're dealing with um, 140 meters at 2.6 grams per ton gold equivalent. Um, and we do have a few other holes that have been countered, um, even longer intercepts through this zone. So it's it's a continuous zone of stockwork mineralization overlain by uh, gold and silver bearing massive sulfide. So working our way about a kilometer and a half to the north of TV, um, we have the Jeff showing here. This is another VMS uh, system here uh, with our uh, dominantly gold and silver bearing um, areas down here to the south. Uh, there are two horizons here, of which this uh, horizon up here appears to be stratigraphically equivalent with the lower zone at TV. So within the Betty Creek formation itself, there are three um, mineralized horizons with gold and silver um, bearing sulfides and sulfur salts. And then extending to the north uh, based on uh, geophysical anomalies and uh, soil uh, silver anomalies and uh, the rock chips, uh, we conducted a, a test along strike to the north of Jeff uh, to determine um, the full extent of this TB Jeff uh, VMS system. And uh, what we found was um, quite an extensive zone along strike. We're talking several kilometers, about two kilometers or so of uh, horizons that are gold and silver bearing anomalously with a few higher grade pockets. Um, but interestingly, there's quite a bit of uh, zinc and copper mineralization, which is indicative in VMS systems of an increase in temperature compared to um, this kind of sulfur salt, SK rich sulfur salt, um, SK Creek type system here. Uh, however, at, at Jeff, we do have intercepts in the past that have gotten bonanza grades. Um, so, you know, while there is quite a bit of base metal mineralization, there are zones with uh, bonanza grade gold and silver mineralization at Jeff. Um, so, you know, I'd say uh, over the past few years, we've confirmed that this system over on the east limb of the Escaini Klein extends for about three and a half to four kilometers and has VMS style mineralization. However, it's um, most likely uh, we're distal to a system that is centered more on TV as far as precious metals are concerned. Uh, but it's still uh, confirming the hypothesis that there are multiple VMS systems along these trends uh, all in our property here. Um, so working our way is uh, the Jeff North area. This is more of that base metal rich zone. We've started to uh, conduct more soil sampling to identify um, potential zones of mineralization along strike to the north here. Uh, as I had mentioned, this zone here where we had to build helipads is very rugged. 
we will be returning to this area next season to continue our exploration efforts here because it's really interesting that proceeding from Jeff North, there's this trend of uh, gold and silver bearing rock chip samples collected over the past 30 years, including some more recent ones. That's so following this these trends of the sky tim conductors up here. And it's just these sorts of conductors that we're finding VMS mineralization on elsewhere on the property. Um, so that combined with the presence of gold and silver um, from sulfide bearing samples leads us to uh, believe that this is a highly prospective area that would be connecting um, this Jeff North area with a showing we call hexagon mercury, which is actually near SIB. We're kind of getting towards the middle of this fold here and popping over onto the west side of this fold here. But this trend uh, does seem to continue well up towards SIB. So it's quite likely that we have additional VMS systems continuing along the full strike length of this anticline, which is um, really what we want. You know, the more of these things we have, the better chance we have of finding uh, something comparable to SK Creek. So uh, as I had mentioned, we're, we're looking for this property-wide prospectivity here. Uh, I uh, talked about our uh, fantastic bleg results down here in the south, as well as this area up in the north uh, east part of the property, which has really become a, a prominent part of our exploration program over the past couple of years. So I'll start talking about Tarn Lake and Scarlet Knob. Uh, we just had a, a press release last week that uh, handled these two areas here, as well as the broader Scarlet Tarn trend. Um, but we'll focus in on Tarn Lake and Scarlet Knob uh, right now. And here's a, a map right here showing the area uh, as well as where Tarn Lake here, Scarlet Knob over here. And then uh, we have uh, rock chip samples collected in, uh, in 1990 with these squares. And then the circles are actually ones collected um, over the past year. So being this close to a glacier, it's important to note that um, this area here at Tarn Lake was covered in ice 30 years ago, and the front of the glacier was about up to here uh, 30 years ago. So most of the areas that uh, we've explored that we found are more sulfide rich than the areas explored in 1990 were buried under ice 30 years ago. So we have new ground to explore up here, and that's what our uh, teams got out and did. Um, notably, uh, we found uh, rock chip samples. This area is quite well mineralized uh, with uh, stock work and replacement style sulfides that are focused around these east-west trending andesite dikes. So these would be dikes uh, emplaced along what we call sin volcanic structures, the, the um, geological structures that feed VMS fluids and uh, basically supply uh, the metals for the system. Um, and that, that's what we're finding is we've got mineralization focused along these sin volcanic structures that are all over the place. And this area, um, quite a bit of sulfide mineralization here at Scarlet Knob, including a 56.9 gram per ton rock chip sample uh, that has 154 grams per ton silver. And this is not an outlier. Uh, back in 1990, about 500 meters to the north, uh, there are uh, comparable grades here at 56.6 grams per ton gold right here. And then a whole host of other um, respectable gold results from these rock chips. And again, it's important to note this area is quite well mineralized with sulfide on the surface. Um, and then popping over the other side of the glacier, uh, we started taking a look at Tarn Lake and found quite a bit of uh, semi-massive and replacement style sulfide over here. Both of these areas, mineralization is hosted by SK Rhyolite. This was not um, indicated on previous uh, geological maps. Uh, so this is very important because as, as you may have um, Remembered, SK Rhyolite is the uh, stratigraphic position that is hosting mineralization at the SK Creek mine. So what 
we're dealing with here are VMS systems that were active at the same time that Eskate Creek was active. So we're looking at a time equivalent horizon here, um, same type of system, same type of rocks, and we're actually finding very similar types of um, mineralogy at these two deposits uh, of which we drilled at Torn Lake this season. So just taking a quick look at what we can actually see in the field, um, right? we again have a very, very broad zone of goss in this, and that is oxidized sulfides staining these rocks bright red and orange uh, with uh, quite a few areas of massive sulfide replacement of uh, sedimentary rocks and rhyolite. So that's telling us that we're near the seafloor position here. That's where we want to be if we're trying to vector towards um, massive sulfide or um, deposits like you would have at Eskate Creek. And then looking through the hand lens here, we actually have visible silver minerals within these sulfides. Uh, so that combined with just getting out with our handheld XRF units, uh, we're able to identify uh, these zones of um, silver mineralization. Unfortunately, the handheld XRF does not detect gold. Uh, however, it will allow us to identify elements like uh, silver arsenic anemone that occur with gold uh, frequently. So uh, focusing on uh, some of the higher grade uh, samples that we collected before drilling, um, we're uh, dealing here at Torn Lake uh, with our 9.2 gram per ton gold uh, sample here. And uh, we've got a replacement style sulfide mineralization. That is the host rhyolite, which is kind of this light, uh, kind of gray white color here is being replaced by our sulfide minerals. Um, notably in this uh, sample, there's a, a good bit of pyrite as well as arsenopyrite and spalerite. Um, and, and here's an idea of just the scale of what we're dealing with at Torn Lake, standing in the bottom of the outcrop is um, Jesse Hill uh, right here for scale. So it's quite a large zone and extends a long strike at a minimum of 500 meters with uh, this um, Gaussian right here. And as I'll explain, there's a, a very high likelihood that this mineralization actually goes underneath Bruce Glacier and connects with the mineralization at um, Scarlet Knob, which is 800 meters to the east. But with our rock, champ, uh, our rock chip sampling, we're able to show that we're getting good uh, gold and silver grades all the way up to the margin of the glacier on both sides. So that's one of the things we're really excited to test is to see what's going on underneath this glacier. Jumping to the other side of the glacier over here, um, we're at uh, Scarlet Knob, and, and that's showing our um, sample that had 56.9 grams per ton gold right there, um, dominated again by pyrite, galena, and spalerite within SK rhyolite. Uh, these sorts of mineral assemblages are very similar uh, to the, the mineralogy at SK Creek Mine. Uh, so not only are we dealing with a time equivalent VMS system, but we also have the same sort of uh, minerals in the system, which strongly suggests that we've got a, a similar type of hydrothermal system operating here uh, that operated at SK Creek. Very exciting. Uh, so looking at some of our early drill results here, it's worth noting that in this area, all of the drilling was a maiden drill program. There were, were not previous drill holes in this area. Um, as we mentioned, a lot of this stuff was under ice, uh, like Tarn Lake 30 years ago, and nobody's really done much out here. Uh, so Tarn Lake, um, as well as Scarlet Valley, which I'll discuss, and Scarlet Ridge, um, stood out as targets worth um, going after because they are focused on these thin volcanic structures with sulfide mineralization. And, and as you'll see, Tarn Lake seems to be uh, the best out of this area. It's the most intensely hydrothermally altered, um, the most consistent uh, gold and silver mineralization, not only on the surface, but also within drill core here, uh, where we've, um, on these uh, 
you know, initial kind of wildcat holes, we're able to intercept uh, a pretty good continuous zone of uh, gold and silver mineralization cutting uh, through here between these two holes. This is a cross section, as well as a whole slew of uh, gold and silver bearing rock chip samples continuing up onto the surface. Um, and then this map view here actually shows uh, that if you proceed um, about 90 meters or so to the south, that this uh, gold and silver bearing horizon continues. And uh, while we have assays pending for the drill holes in here, what I can say is that those are sulfide bearing as well. Uh, so I've, it certainly looks like on this southern pad here uh, that we have intercepted a um, pretty well mineralized and intensely hydrothermally altered zone of replacement style uh, VMS sulfide mineralization. Um, also worth noting uh, that that uh, sulfide mineralization continued right up near the margin of the glacier. Uh, there was a fault cutting through here that would prevented us from kind of going under where some of these other rock chip samples were. So there's much more work to be done out here um, to define the extent of this system. This is just the beginning. We've only drilled 10 drill holes at Tarn Lake. Looking at the mineralization itself, uh, again, hosted by SK Rhyolite, uh, and we have this semi-massive replacement style sulfide mineralization. This is where the highest grades are coming from. Um, and one of the exciting things is despite uh, the mineralization surrounding this being very strongly anomalous, by that I mean between 0.1 and half a gram per ton uh, gold, uh, the big question of the season was looking at all of this stock work and disseminated sulfide that's filling in vesicles, that is these bubbles within the magma, um, as well as replacing crystals that were within this rock. Sulfide is replacing these, and this sulfide is gold and silver bearing. All of the disseminated uh, mineralization is gold and silver bearing, um, and what we see, it's replacement style as well. So we're, we really uh, want to vector towards this most intense zone of sulfide replacement and ideally um, find a C4 position where these fluids uh, would precipitate these massive sulfides uh, hosted on the seafloor. Um, so we're certainly in the right area and we're definitely in a, a very well gold and silver um, mineralized zone. Again, uh, here's some of our uh, holes released in last week's uh, release, um, starting uh, with um, these three right here forming this trend uh, that's uh, you know about 90 meters between uh, this hole and these two holes here and um, you know we've got um, 3.36 meters at 1.85 grams per ton gold equivalent here in the south but then going to turn 10 where we have a much broader zone of 41 meters that um, uh, is at uh, 1.1 grams per ton gold equivalent. So again, we have quite a bit of silver occurring with uh, this gold, um, showing that you know it's a fairly thick zone of gold and silver mineralization. And then working our way kind of down dip um, just a bit to the, the west of Tarn 10, we have Tarn 12 as well that has another um, intercept here at um, nearly seven meters at two grams per ton gold equivalent. So, you know, that combined with the potential um, for uh, continuity of mineralization between Tarn Lake going all the way over here, exactly due east on the same trend as these feeder structures that we've identified as where our 56.9 gram per ton sample is over here. All of this zone over here is very gothinous and sulfide mineralized. You know, I'd say that other 56 gram per ton sample is somewhere up over in this area. Um, we're not sure about connectivity under here because this is all covered by glacier or excuse me, glacial till right here. Um, however, there are some older holes from the early 1990s, sort of on the back side of this hill. Um, 
and what they called the AP zone that intercepted up to 3.8 grams per ton gold over a few meters over there. Uh, so it does show that there is gold and silver over here as well. Um, and then Scarlet Valley, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, we drilled uh, here as well. And then the Scarlet Ridge will kind of be up and over this hill. Uh, but, you know, I think the big takeaway is looking at Tarn Lake and Scarlet Knob and the, just the fact that it's both um, SK rhyolite and quite well mineralized at both of these zones argues that um, there could be a continuity of this feeder structure underneath this glacier and there could be um, quite a bit more mineralization. Um, just want to show you a, another picture of the Scarlet Knob area. We've not drilled here yet. Uh, we're very eager to do that um, as well as do uh, what we call channel sampling. We have an ideal area where it's glacially polished, no vegetation, well exposed mineralization. We can take a rock saw and cut trenches in these rocks and collect uh, samples that are going to be as representative of mineralization as drill core would be for a fraction of the cost uh, doing this on the surface. So that's something we're very excited about is getting out and really trying to vector towards the, the heart of this um, mineralized system, which we're confident is centered around Scarlet Knob and Tarn Lake. And that's also based off of um, comparisons with some of these other targets that we drilled to the north along this trend. So we have Scarlet Valley, uh, which you know is about 800 meters or so to the northeast of uh, Scarlet Knob, where we have uh, drill holes that kind of went along the feeder structure I hear that we have an andesite dike and quite um, well sulfide mineralized uh, zone through here that's uh, hosted in this case, proximal to SK rhyolite, but more within the sedimentary horizons on the flanks of these uh, rhyolite domes. This is a submarine environment again. So we've got quite a bit of rhyolite bearing what we call volcanoclastic rock, or just fragments of this rhyolite that kind of broke off and got deposited on the seafloor um, with andesite dike cutting through this. Um, so we, we're in the right sort of stratigraphy over here. Um, and that's something that's really important for us as geologists, exploration geologists to understand with BMS is stratigraphy because we're dealing with stratigraphy controlled mineralizing system. So you have to pay attention to these things. Uh, this is um, an example right here of the, uh, the outcrop that we drilled in. There's the drill right there. And this is the drill trace of uh, one of our early drill holes cutting through this zone of mineralization. Um, for the most part, here what we found uh, was mineralization really closely hugging to these andesite dikes along this feeder structure uh, with some sulfide replacement of the andesite itself, as well as uh, this volcanoclastic uh, rock right here. Um, has variable amounts of uh, gold and silver uh, within these sulfides. And I'll also note that the hydrothermal alteration is a bit less intense up here at Scarlet Valley compared with um, uh, Tarn Lake. So looking at our uh, drill results here, um, going along with that uh, lower intensity of hydrothermal alteration, we're also seeing that while we have uh, gold and silver mineralization within the sulfide that's not quite as extensive as it is at Tarn Lake, and uh, just visually looking on the surface, uh, Scarlet Knobs actually uh, more well mineralized as well. Uh, however, we're still within a VMS system here and still gold and silver bearing. So I would say chances are that this VMS extends all the way from uh, Scarlet Knob, that full 800 meters up to Scarlet Valley. Uh, but the uh, intensity of alteration and the focus of the precious metals is more around our uh, Tarn Lake and Scarlet Knob showings at this point. And then working our way about a kilometer further to the northeast, uh, we have Scarlet Ridge, which again is a um, set of um, 
stock work mineralization and quite a bit of replacement style sulfide mineralization associated with our andesite dikes once again. So there's a lot of these feeder structures along this trend. Um, and then we have uh, quite a bit of uh, andesite replacement again, as well as this unique texture here, which we call a perlite. I don't need to go into the details, but a lot of sulfide uh, mineralization uh, replacing uh, these rocks here. However, um, as messed up as these rocks look, they're not as hydrothermally altered as Scarlet Valley. So going along with um, this trend from Tarn Lake and Scarlet Knob, we're getting more into the distal part of this VMS system up here, uh, where we're really intercepted uh, some gold mineralization up to about three grams per ton at the top of these holes, but for the most part, uh, these sulfides are barren. So and what we're dealing with here is a big trend, again, associated with our conductive bodies here. The glacier kind of comes through this area and appears to be influencing the, uh, the signal uh, returned from uh, our uh, conductivity survey. But what we've got is our uh, focus of mineralization around Tarn Lake and Scarlet Knob here and then working our way to the north while there are still quite a bit of uh, gold and silver bearing rock chip samples through here, we are getting um, away or more towards the distal part of this large VMS system here. Um, and something that's very exciting is um, a lower resolution survey we flew in 2018, also showing conductivity shows a cluster of uh, gold and silver bearing samples uh, down here, right along trend from Tarn Lake. So what it's looking like is that we have a parallel trend of VMS mineralization over here to the east that parallels the trend going from our, you know, Eskay Creek would be up here all the way down this Eskay anticline. Not only do we have that, we've got two sides to that anticline. We have a whole other uh, probably anticlinal structure over here with another parallel trend of VMS mineralization. And it's possible there's some over here and over here as well. Uh, we just need to go explore. It's a big rugged property, um, but it's highly likely that there's going to be more Hazelton group stratigraphy located on these margins of these anticlines. Uh, so I'm going to start talking about Sib up here now and going down to Lulu and along this uh, SK anticline trend just to show um, some of the, the work that's been done. Um, so this is all historical drill results, uh, you know, mostly between um, the early 1990s to the 2018 program. However, one of the things that we've been doing over the past few years is re-examining old drill core to assist with new interpretations on the property. And one of the things uh, we've identified, and you know, Skeena Resources has seen this as well, uh, that there are multiple stratigraphic positions that have VMS mineralization here. Um, starting off in the northern part of our property here, so this is our property boundary. This cluster of drill holes here is uh, the Tamakai zone on Skeena's ground. Um, you know, I go and look at the press releases and add this stuff to our, our model because, you know, these things occur on stratiform trends. Knowing what's going on along the whole trend can inform you about what's happening in other parts of this trend. Uh, we've got several drill holes of variably wide spacing here. You know, in this case, we're looking at about 300 meters between drill holes. You can fit a deposit, a VMS deposit between some of these drill holes out here. Um, and then there's others that are more closely clustered. Um, and then these sort of, these black lines here, these are just kind of um, conceptual uh, drill holes that we would do to infill, drill this area. And that's something that uh, you know, following from our neighbors to the north, Skeena Resources has had quite a bit of success with um, drilling between these widely spaced drill holes. Um, this horizon here 
is hosted by the Spat CZ formation. This is part of the, the bottom of the upper Hazleton group. So this isn't even in the SK rhyolite. Uh, this is um, a different horizon that has been intercepted previously, but uh, prior operators were um, so focused on getting to the exact same stratigraphic level as SK Creek that they ignored the fact that those up to six other mineralized horizons split between the lower and upper Hazleton group rocks. So mineral, VMS mineralization occurred probably in two pulses and was quite widespread in the area is what we're uh, seeing. And then, you know, working our way to the south here, again, a whole bunch of very widely spaced drill holes with some very good intercepts um, kind of all floating by themselves that have never been followed up on. I mean, we're talking drill holes from the early 1990s with nothing else around them um, with quite a bit of uh, gold in some of these. And in this case, from 2008, uh, we've got a 13.75 gram per ton intercept over a meter within a larger zone. And that would be um, this drill hole right in here, a larger zone along the same stratigraphic position going all the way up onto uh, the Tamakai zone. Uh, that's, you know, we're, we're dealing with about 20 meters or so, 25 meters of uh, mineralization here within this uh, Spatsizi horizon. We also have um, the Lulu zone over here, which is hosted by uh, the SK Rhyolite. Um, itself. So now we're getting closer to what the uh, historic world-class SK Creek mine was intercepting. And again, uh, a lot of these drill holes are from the early 1990s and early 2000s. Um, the Lulu zone proper is a pod of very high grade. I mean, we're getting up to um, 95 grams per ton. I'd say a, a lot of the uh, grading is kind of averaging more around 20 grams per ton gold um, quite a bit of silver. As you can see, this piece here is massive mirargerite, which is a silver antimony sulfo salt. Um, and if I recall, this is, you know, something on the order of uh, 2,000 grams per ton silver and about 20 grams per ton gold um, located within this pod right here. Um, you know, and if you watch some of the older videos on our website, there's actually kind of a wedge of unmineralized rock that got faulted into this zone here. Uh, but there are indications from drilling to the north and south that this mineralized zone, because all of our bedding is kind of vertical tilted right here, that this zone of mineralization could um, continue underneath uh, this uh, fault wedge here. And uh, very importantly, we see intense hydrothermal alteration um, several intercepts of gold and silver and drill holes, as well as rock chip samples going down through here and defining of what we're interpreting to be a feeder zone cutting through most of the Hazleton group right here. Um, and in addition to some stuff that's uh, hosted within the lower Hazleton group um, to the um, east of Lulu. And this again is hosted by upper Hazleton group, SK Rhyolite going about 10 kilometers or so to the south, um, still on the west limb of the SK Anticline, there's another showing called Cumberland that uh, historically was mined at the turn of the 20th century, very small scale mining. Uh, however, uh, drilling from the early 2000s has confirmed that we are dealing with the basalt rhyolite contact here. This is the exact stratigraphic position that uh, the historic high-grade mineralization at Escape Creek occurred in. Uh, so we know that this horizon continues well to the south of Escape Creek. I mean, at this point, we're talking about 18 kilometers to the south. This trend of mineralization continues. And uh, one thing you'll notice here, uh, a lot of this drilling stopped in mineralization. So... We don't know how deep this goes. Um, this is just one horizon of up to six mineralized horizons in this area. So not only could this specific zone of mineralization continue uh, to some extent, 
but there may be additional zones of mineralization lower down that were basically exploiting this same synvolcanic rift structure that just gets reactivated repeatedly throughout uh, these uh, phases of BMS mineralization. So very exciting uh, that we're really showing we've got a lot of VMS systems on this property, um, and several of them are gold and silver bearing uh, with a lot of potential to find and vector towards these um, massive sulfide horizons, as well as this kind of clastic or debris flow type of mineralization that Eskate Creek itself is. Um, going back to our uh, property-wide prospectivity map, I just want to hit on a couple uh, more areas that we've been looking at this year, uh, notably our uh, uh, Vermilion area down here. And then we have uh, another area called the Virginia Lakes over here, uh, which is also within Hazleton Group Rock and could be um, at the same horizon as Eskay Creek as well. So looking at Vermilion, uh, this is a very rugged high altitude area. Uh, it's received quite a bit of attention in the past, um, predominantly with rock chip sampling of which there are several um, very high grade um, spot rock chip samples collected throughout this area. Uh, this is something that our, our team has focused on um, in 2021. Uh, we had a, a mapping effort um, out there. Uh, and then and this year as well, we went out with a, a focus on validating uh, this map, as well as characterizing the type of mineralization out here, um, because looking at some of the old drill core, we have gold and silver mineralization, dominantly gold, associated with quartz and carbonate veining. It just didn't feel like a VMS system. And uh, what our working hypothesis is now is that there's uh, possibly an orogenic gold system down here to the south. Um, that's um, more associated with uh, metamorphic rocks and um, fault structures, of which here you see a, a thrust fault structure right here, um, large structures that would actually um, be along this kind of contact right here. But these faults, as well as um, the foliation and the structures basically jointing and stuff that kind of pops open these rocks and provides pathways for fluids to flow through are just riddled with quartz and carbonate veining as well as uh, manganese oxide mineralization. And um, the majority of the high grade historic samples collected in this area come from these sorts of rocks. Um, so we're, we're dealing with green schist metamorphic rocks near um, fault structures and we have you know just all of these different um, joints and things filled with quartz veining it, it looks like an orogenic um, gold um, deposit over there and that that's interesting but as I mentioned at the beginning we're focusing on looking for SK Creek type VMS deposits right now we're characterizing these sorts of things but our focus is really going to be on a VMS type mineralization. Not to say that an orogenic deposit or a porphyry deposit wouldn't be welcome, uh, but we're looking for VMS. Uh, which brings us back to Virginia Lakes. This is kind of off on the central western part of our property. Uh, there's been some exploring again in 1991 and really nothing else since then uh, that identified a cluster of um, gold bearing samples kind of within this zone here associated with a magnetic anomaly and uh, that's what this map is and there's also a, a moderate to weak sky tim anomaly in this area followed by you know just a few drill holes here uh, that it intercepted several meters uh, ranging between one to five grams per ton uh, right here so we know that that's gold and uh, to some extent, not even really silver bearing, but gold bearing. And importantly, uh, the old historic logs indicate that these are within felsic breccia, which could mean SK rhyolite. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have any of this drill core anymore. So we'll, we'll have to get out there and actually get boots on the ground coming up <clears throat> this year to see if uh, this structure along the Hamel Fault 
has actually associated um, with SK or rhyolite hosted DMS mineralization. So this is, you know, yet another showing on our property. And we have several other things to look at as well. But I, I would say going forward, we're really looking forward to this Torn Lake uh, Scarlet Knob trend and continuing our exploration along the SK anticline uh, to identify more uh, VMS systems and um, hopefully have success with our hunt for finding uh, SK2. And uh, with that, I, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for being here and I'll take questions. Thank you. Um, do you have the map that shows uh, the locale from Skyrim, Scarlet Valley, and Esker Creek? It should be. Seven kilometers to the west. Yeah, uh, it's on here somewhere. Mm -hmm. That would be here. Yep. So SK Creek over here. You know, they have they've been drilling several deposits along this trend. So it's not like this is just up here by itself. And it continues down onto here. And what we're starting to show, there's actually a really good bug anomaly down here with soil anomalies. Um that way we're starting to get into um, this trend continuing down here. Cumberland, which I showed, is kind of over here. So that, that entire trend continues for tens of kilometers. And we're starting to show that it, it is mineralized along a lot of that. And, you know, again, parallel trend over here. And the beautiful thing about anticlines, those two sides to these things. So as we're already showing over here, uh, TB and Jeff, we've got west limb and east limb mineralization at six, up to six stratigraphic positions on two different structures. So a lot of ground to cover, all helicopter supported, but we're getting out there with our army of uh, geologists um, and figuring this thing out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would I wouldn't say it's we don't see as much mercury as they do, except for this hexagon mercury zone where we're getting like a thousand ppm mercury. Uh, but the stuff we've drilled out at Tarn Lake Scarlet Knob, I don't think in the last few years we haven't had any mercury that's over about 30 ppm. Um, we're certainly seeing elevated arsenic, um, you know, up into the low thousands of um, ppm, uh, as well as I'd say with our uh, base metal mineralization here, uh, we're getting arsenic up to ten thousands of ppm. But that that's generally not the sorts of levels we're seeing associated with gold. Anemone is more common where we're getting uh, high abundances of silver sulfur salts. So very similar sort of uh, mineral suite, um, I'd say without like the really intense uh, mercury, except for again, hexagon mercury over here. But we're, we're certainly seeing elevated mercury. Yes. Can you comment on the anticipated timeline for additional drill results for the remainder of the program? Um, sometime in the next few weeks, not too much longer. Yeah, we do. I know our, uh, Tom Weiss, our geophysicist, has um, done quite a bit of work uh, with the SkyTim uh, data, trying to um, basically, especially over the TV and Jeff area. Um, kind of work with a, a novel approach to uh, do airborne IP, um, which, you know, it, it reasonably agrees with the ground-based IP that we uh, conducted in this area in 2020. Um, but yeah, that, that's something actually we'd, we'd like to discuss um, 
that you yeah, actually <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, the uh I would, the structural mapping, let me get these high really strong conductors here agree very well with the locations of uh, graphitic mudstone along thrust faults. So we certainly see structure here and, and this here, there's a a, a sinistral cross-cutting strike slip fault, kind of like this N echelon series of these things here. Um, you definitely see thrust faults as well as these uh, conductive bodies right here. This, this is actually defining stratigraphy. Uh, so we see a, a very good correlation with our, our SkyTIM data, uh, geological structures and stratigraphy, as well as mineralization. I mean, a lot of these areas are very, um, strongly sulfide mineralized plus or minus uh, precious metals as well as hydrothermally altered and you know that's that's holding true for uh Tarn Lake DB Jeff Jeff North Sid as well so we're we're pretty happy with um using the sky tim results and the, the induced polarization actually helped uh, guide us to um a lot of the targets at uh, Jeff North uh, this year as well. So that the has a high success of identifying sulfide mineralization. Now it's a matter does the gold and silver come with it. Thanks everybody for coming and um hope you're as excited as we are about this project. If we're gonna find a second SK Creek, it's probably a good bet to be surrounding uh, the SK Creek mine. So certainly finding VMS systems out here.